Hey everyone, how's it going? Thanks for being here. For this stream I'm planning to try out something different, so we're going to make a sort of Q&A, sort of a quiz where I can post a question, then you can vote in chat, and then we can see and learn a bunch of things together. That's pretty much the goal with this live stream. First of all, just for testing, let me actually make a simple question. Let's go create a quiz, and there you go, a very simple and basic quiz and basically you vote in chat by doing vote and then either A or B. That's pretty much the goal and let's see if all of this works correctly. So as you vote, there you go, the little characters, <laughs> they move there, it's pretty silly but all right, look at that. <laughs> all right, that's great, so far it seems to be working correctly. So I'm going to vote myself as well, so in my case I'm going to go with dogs, so I'm going to vote B. <laughs> look at that, it's pretty much 50-50. Ah, uh, that's funny. <laughs> And then, well, the next part is when there's a question, when the time is just visual, so I can then manually end it. And I can either say one question is correct or all of them are correct. So in this case, all of them are correct. So let's go ahead, end the quiz. And there you go, they're all correct, they're all happy, everybody succeed. <laughs> Okay, so basically I'm going to try to show some questions and you can vote on the answer, then I can talk about some learning thing related to the question. All right, okay, so let me first post a post the first question. There you go, create quiz, and there you go, the brand new question. So what is the name of the game relating to the game in the free course? So is it Kitchen Chaos, Cloner Cooked, or Chef Chaos? So let's see if all of you know the first basic question. I mean, the clue is kind of on screen, but let's see if all of you know it. All right, look at that. So there's two solitary people on C, and for some reason, some people are on D, even though there's no D right now. <laughs> some people on B, and most people over here on A. There you go, look at that. All those people. And the correct one for this one is obviously A, Kitchen Chaos. So let's end the quiz. And there you go, everybody's really happy. <laughs> yeah, let's start with a proper question. So this is on the lecture for the Create the Project. And the question is, which Unity version did I use in the course? So was it the 2021 LTS, the 2022 tech version, or was it the 23 alpha version? So go ahead, post your votes. And this one is with regards to the create project lecture. So by the way, over here on the website, here is the course curriculum. And if you click on one of these, it automatically scrolls down. And there you go, yep, the correct answer is indeed over here B, and it is the tech version. So usually, technically, when it comes to Unity versions, you should probably stick with the LTS version. But the only reason why I went with the tech version for this uh, course is because I want the course, I want the video to stay up to date for as long as possible. Technically, usually you should use LTS. I just went with tech because tech is going to turn into the LTS version in about two months. Usually around March or April, that's when Unity launches their brand new LTS version. So at around that time, 22 should turn into LTS. So at that time, you should be able to use that one. And there you go, here is the question. So this one is with regards to lecture two, so that's the layout lecture. So this one is, do you know about the pivot center and local global buttons? Yes, no, maybe. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> so let's see who gets this reference. <laughs> and yeah, there you go. So the question is with regards to the pivot center and local global buttons. These are extremely important. You definitely need to know about them. So let's see how many of you know about them. So most people are going into yes, that's awesome. Because this is actually two very important buttons that a lot of people don't know about. So yeah. And for this one, there's really no wrong answer because it's a general. So congratulations to all of you. So here is a basic testing project just to test it out. And basically the buttons that I'm referring to are the ones up here on the scene view. So there's this one on this side, which says center or pivot. And there's another one, which is global or local. And basically these are extremely important. So for example, if you've got a game object, let's make it a cube instead. So let's make an empty cube. So there you go, here is a cube. And if inside I put another object, so let's say I put another cube inside this cube, and for this other cube, let's put it somewhere on the side. So now if I select the parent object, and if over there it is selected on pivot, look at where the transform handle is. It's right there, it's exactly on the origin of that object. However, if up there, if now I change to center, now instead of being on the pivot, now it's over there on the center. Now if you try rotating, you would assume that it would rotate right over there where the handle is. If you look over there, it is not rotating just on the Y, but also moving on the X and also moving on the Z. So if I move it even further away, and I select this one, there you go. With that one set to center, now it actually selects the transform handle right on the center. And if I rotate it, look over there, it's not just rotating on the Y. If I rotate on the Y, it rotates like this. 
But if I rotate on the handle, it rotates like that. So this is something that is usually very confusing if you don't know what is going on. So that is why this is extremely important. And pretty much in 99% of cases, you want to leave this one on pivot. That's That way it makes sense. So if you rotate over there, it rotates on the pivot exactly as it should. And the next one, that one is the local or global. So that is with regards to rotation. So for example, let's say on the parent, I rotate this one. Let's rotate it pointed upwards like this. So like this, this is set on local mode and look at how the handles are rotated kind of slanted. Whereas if I put this in global, now the handles have the global rotation. So regardless of how the object is rotated, these are always like this. So if I move over here on the red arrow, you would assume that it moves just on the, I think the red is the Z or no, it's the, it's the X. You would think by this, it would only move on the X. Whereas if I put it on local, if I put it like this, this one is moved based on the rotation that the object is in. So if you want to put an object in front of it somewhere like this, and you want to just push the object to the side, then it's usually better to use it on local. Whereas if you want to move it relative to the world itself, put it on global and move it around. So yeah, basically these two are some of the things that can really drive you crazy if you don't know about them. So in most cases, you really want to leave this one on pivot and this one either on local or global, depending on the use case. All right, so here's the question. So on the lecture for Visual Studio, so what Visual Studio extension did I use for the extra colors in the code? So was it called Color Plus? Is it nothing? Is it just the Visual Studio defaults? Or is it VS4? So it seems a lot of people are confident in C. Is that correct? Some people are still over here stuck on D. I don't know why, because there's no D right now. <laughs> and the correct answer is C. Indeed, it is VH4. Yep, so that it is. So here is my Visual Studio and basically on extensions, manage extensions. And over here, if you search for online, you'll find VH4. And there you go. It adds color to your Visual Studio text editor. So this is the one that I use in the course. And basically what it does, it adds a bunch more colors. So look at this. Over here, the default in the case is in a nice pink, so the switch in a nice orange, and the types in a different color, then the functions in another color. Having all of these colors really makes the code much easier to read, much easier to see. I would definitely recommend you grab this extension, so that is called VH4, and yep, 61 of you did indeed correctly guess, so yep, congratulations. And there you go, okay, so here's the question, which is, which one of these is correct? So, Pascal case, Camel case, and Snake case. These are the names for the capitalization of the letters, the words, and so on. And let's see which one is indeed correct. And if there you go, it is indeed option A. So congratulations to all of you. Definitely make sure you always use the correct naming rules. I mean, correct is a bit of a wrong word. The important thing is that you are consistent. So whatever naming rules you follow, doesn't matter. You can follow Pascal case for functions or maybe use Pascal case for class names or maybe use it for fields or maybe properties, whatever you want. The most important thing when it comes to code style naming rules, just being consistent. So whatever you do, whatever you choose, come up with a style that makes sense to you and then stick with it. That's pretty much it. Okay, so with regards to post-processing, should you add post-processing as soon as possible? And let's end the quiz and which one is the correct answer? And the answer is all of them are correct. <laughs> Basically, when it comes to post-processing, usually you probably shouldn't do it like literally at the first thing. So you should probably focus on the actual mechanics and the actual things. So personally for me, post-processing is something that I'll leave later on in the process when I actually want to show the game to someone. So when I want to promote it and so on. However, one thing that a lot of people have mentioned, which I do think that it makes a lot of sense, which is post-processing can also help you with regards to motivation. So if you're the kind of person who has trouble with motivation, motivating yourself, with actually continuing to work on the game, if that's the, the kind of mindset that you have, then post-processing can actually help because by post-processing, you're usually making sure that your visuals look quite a bit better. So if you focus on that in the very beginning, that can actually help you stick with the project for the long run which in turn obviously helps you actually finish that project. And there you go. Okay, so question, this one is on lecture seven. So that's in lecture on the character controller. Should you make all of your variables public? So A, no, yes, or yes, because I want to torture my programmer teammates. <laughs> okay, so that's it. So let's go ahead and the quiz and see which one is the answer for this one. And yep, of course, the answer is indeed A, so no you should not make all of your variables public. In fact, they should never be public. So pretty much, I generally don't think I've ever seen a use case for public var Well, the exception would be on scriptable objects. So for those, I usually do make them public because on a scriptable object, which I always deal as a read-only data container. But yeah, for regular variables, yeah, they should never be public. There's no reason to be public. So for example, over here, I got a public, a float for the move speed. Let's say this is the character script. 
And then I've got another one. So public class for the enemy. So the enemy is doing something. And over here, the enemy has a reference to the character. So the character, so this is the player character. And then on private void update, for some reason, the enemy decides that it wants to mess up the character. So you can go into the character, set the move speed equal zero. And there you go, this one is perfectly valid code. So the enemy can suddenly modify the move speed on the character and everything breaks and your player can no longer move because you accidentally modified something when it should never be modified. So basically by making it public, you are enabling both read and write access from any other class. So if you have a thousand classes in your code base, then that's a thousand points where you might be modifying this, which might cause all kinds of breakage things in your game. So you don't want that. Okay, so this one is gonna be on lecture eight. So that is the lecture on the character visual and rotation. So in this lecture, what is the difference between lerp and slurp? So is the difference that slurp sounds bad, which I guess maybe a little bit. Uh, is it that lerp works with vectors and slurp works with directions? Or lerp works with directions and slurp works with vectors? All right, so let's end the quiz. And there you go, yep, the answer is over here indeed B. So lerp works with vectors, whereas slurp works with directions. Now, the important thing with this one is, for example, if you make a interpolation between a vector pointing right and then a vector pointing left, if you do that and you use slurp, then basically it's going to rotate because it's going to work with directions. Whereas if you use it with lerp, then basically this vector is going to shrink and then pretty much do a 180 and stick around there. So that might sound a bit confusing. So maybe the... <laughs> okay, so here is the demo that I'm showing. So basically what matters over there, the blue arrow. So currently this one is using slurp. So let's see what this one does. So if I head on play, look at that blue arrow and let's see what it does. And there you go, it rotates around like that. So look what it does. Okay, so this one is using lerp and basically the starting vector is one zero. So a vector pointing to right. And look how this, the vector basically becomes shorter and shorter until it gets into zero and then flips around to the other end and then becomes, so basically becomes shorter and then goes out. Whereas if you use slurp, and there you go. So it starts off on one, and instead of becoming short, this one actually rotates. So this one goes down on the Z, so it goes down like this and rotates around instead of becoming shorter and pointing the other way. So if an animation has a property in yellow saying missing, what exactly is the problem? So is the problem that there is no child object with that exact name? Is it that the animation file is corrupted? Or was the animation not added to the animator state machine? All right, so this is what I'm, what I'm talking about there. That one is in yellow, so what does that mean? So let's end the quiz and see which one is the correct answer. And drum roll, and there you go, the answer is indeed over here A. So the answer is there's no child object with that exact name. Yeah, basically when this happens is because there's no child of this object named exactly head. This is one of the annoying things about animations is that it's actually based on strings, so it's all based on names. So most of you probably already know that I hate strings for identifying things. And basically the reason why this one is saying missing is because I went ahead and I modified this one. So I renamed this one to head two. So now if I play the animation, that one isn't actually going to play the animation because it doesn't have any object named exactly head. So the solution to this is either go up here and you can click, you can click once to select and then wait a bit and then click again and you can rename the object. So if I go over here and I rename this property to head two to match the one over there, there you go, now it's no longer in yellow, so now it does fine. There you go, the head is indeed moving up. Whereas if I put it back into that one, where it says missing, now I move around, now the head does not move. All right, so yeah, this was a, a simple question. Can you use an orthographic camera in a 3D game? And the answer is, yep, you can. So here is my demo scene. So this one is for the main menu for Kitchen Chaos. And if I select the camera, where's my camera? There you go, my main camera. And over here it is set as perspective, so this is like a, it's what you usually think about when you think of a 3D camera, but you can put it as orthographic. So over here the characters, they all look perfectly the same even though they are at different distances. Whereas with a perspective camera, this one up front is much bigger and the ones in front are more squished. <laughs> I don't know the technical terms, that's pretty much it. So the question is, what is the difference between overlap box and box cast? So is it A, overlap box tests if there's a collision on the target area, and box cast tests if there's a collision anywhere between two points? Or is it B, overlap box is 2D, box cast is 3D? Or is it C, overlap box is better suited for characters and box cast for objects? So go ahead and post your votes in chat. Yeah, there you go, the correct answer is indeed A, which is overlap box tests if there's a collision just on the target area, 
whereas the box cast tests if there's a collision anywhere between the two points. So here I've got a testing scene, so let's say this is a wall, and this one actually has a collider, and let's say you've got a character over here, and the character wants to move to this position. So if you do, if the character is here, and you do an overlap box over here on this position, then it won't return false because it won't find any colliders, because there are no colliders directly on this position. Whereas if you use a box cast, basically what the box cast does is it moves a virtual box, or a virtual shape, depends if it's a box cast, sphere cast, and so on. If it's a box cast, then basically the physics system will move a virtual box in the virtual physics space, and it will move from A to B, and in that movement it won't find anything that collides within between the points A and B. So in this case, if you do an overlap box, it won't just test this position and return false, but if you were to do a box cast, it would start from here and move a virtual box onto this direction, and it would find this wall in the middle, so that would return true because it would indeed find something. So what is the cause of the flickering bug? Look at this, look at this flickering. So this is what, so what is the cause of this flickering bug where the texture is flickering back and forth? So is it that two objects are in the mathematically exact position? Is the GPU broken or is it a physics collision? And yep, the answer is indeed A. It is two objects are on the mathematically exact position or like these people mentioned, the more technical term is Z fighting. So it's more in the Z buffer. So basically since this quad is literally on position, where's the position? So there you go, it is literally on zero, just like the floor object. These two are on the exact same thing, so this is a very nasty visual issue. So if you have this, one solution is super simple. Literally just put this a tiny bit off. There you go, just like this, just by moving it by 0.01, and now no longer got the problem. So yep, this is called Z fighting because both are on the exact same depth. So that is what makes it quite annoying. So if you have that, now you know. Just make sure that one of the objects is not on the exact perfect position and everything will be nice and fixed. How many interfaces and base classes can a class implement or extend? So is it A, multiple interfaces but only one base class? Or is it B, uh, multiple base classes but only one interface? Or is it C, as many as you want? So if you got base classes and interfaces, how many can you implement slash extend? And in the quiz, any of there you go, it is indeed correct. So basically, you can implement multiple interfaces but you can only extend one base class. That is one of the limitations and one of the reasons why you should use interfaces over base classes. If you don't know what I'm talking about, here's a quick test. So instead of making a public class, you can make it an interface. So I, my interface. You can do this and then inside you can have a function, my function, and do something. And then on a class you would implement this interface. And again, as it says on the question, you can implement multiple interfaces. But as of C Sharp 7, you can also do something awesome, which is over here. You can do a default implementation. So if you have an interface and already have a bunch of objects that implement that interface, and you want to add something new, you can add a default implementation and everything will work perfectly. So you don't have to actually add the implementation, but you can if you want to. So interfaces are super awesome. For example, if you got a game and some objects have an inventory and some objects don't, you can use an interface to say, I has, inter uh, I has inventory and implement that interface on any object that has an inventory. So interfaces are super powerful. So this is one about C Sharp events. And C Sharp events use something called a function signature. So the question is, what is a function signature? So is it A, the function name? Is it B, the return type and parameter types? Or is it C, the return type, the function name, the parameter types and parameter names? And there you go, the answer is B. So now the majority was actually wrong for the first time. Wow, that is interesting. So yep, the answer is B. For the function signature, what matters is the return type and the parameter types. Meaning that the function name and the parameter names, that does not matter. So you can have a function with different names, different parameter names, as long as the types are correct, that is the one thing that really does matter. All right, so yeah. Thank you all so much for being here on this live stream. This was a different thing. It was an experiment and well, so far it went pretty well. So I'm pretty happy with how it went. So hopefully all of you enjoyed it. So hopefully a bit more in the in the future. So my plan for this year is definitely doing a bunch more live streams and experiment with different things kind of like this. So hopefully you enjoyed it. So thank you all so much for being here. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time.